uh, presentation. Uh, we have 20 minutes to discuss with Torben. If you have some question, please go on. And just previously, if you can identify yourselves. Thank you. Hi, Torben. It's Anton Martínez from Omega Gas. I have a question because one of the main challenges, apart of the technical aspects, probably is the long-term view of the governments. As you have uh, shown in, the, in, the, in your slides, this is not a race, it's a marathon. In which you, you should start to, to run today, but probably your objective is in 2030. As we have seen, this political support as the long-term view as a country probably is the most, uh, one of the most challenging things to achieve. Theoretically speaking, the government should change every four years, and I say theoretically speaking because in, for the time being in Spain it's not been the case. I know. Yeah. Oh, but how do you see disengagement of the countries, or should be the European Union what should encourage the country with any kind of mandatory framework? It's a very good question, and I forgot to say that I had the luck that for the last 30 years, our parliament have been 95% agreeing on energy. So we have a very stable energy policy and climate policy. So it's only two or three people in the parliament who disagree with all the others, all the others. So extreme left and extreme right, they want the same energy change. So, so it means that we will have a very stable regime. We have a very stable subsidy scheme. There's a high trust at the industries, et cetera, et cetera. So I cannot give you that. I could send my Danish politician so you would have, a, <laughs> so you would have the, 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 the wrong people with the right mindset. But I think you should also have the right people. But I think one of the benefits where I have assisted in impacting the politicians is by making socio-economic costs. Because if I was living here in Spain right now, I think I would prepare an analysis where I showed that by changing political direction every fourth years, then you need 30% more money over the next 30 years instead of you have a more stable policy. And I guess if such a report were public, the politicians needed to agree, even though they don't want to agree, they needed to agree and say to the population, we, we will accept this compromise because then we will save 30% of the money. It might be 100% of the money or, or even more. So for me, all this is costs. In the law, I have a law on Energinet. It has four sentences. I told them to you <laughs> beforehand. So it's a build and maintain. It's about uh, integration of renewable energy. It's about markets. It's about security of supply. And then I have a fifth one, which is I make socioeconomic decisions. So for all the decisions we have in our company, we prepare a socioeconomic analysis. What's, what's best for the country? And then if we have, let's say, something which is very expensive for my company, our supervisory boards don't want to do it. It's not the case. But let's say that they didn't want to use 1 billion euro for any of these circles. They had to do it because in the law it stipulated that our decisions should supp be supported by socioeconomic analysis. And it's not me who make the methodology. It's the Ministry of Finance. It's not me who come with the numbers. It's the Ministry of Energy. So we prepare analysis. So we say, should we have a, a scenario of development where we only use electricity? It has this price. Should we have a mixed one where we have both electricity and gas? It's cheaper. And that's why we go into some of these, these projects here. So it's based on social economy. OK, thanks. So then just, just related with this last comment, the viability, economic viability of these projects, yes. <clears throat> my main concern is the following one. We are moving towards a system with a high penetration of renewables. We are improving of our energy efficiency standards. So we are depressing the CO2 price, mm -hmm. which will be the business model, be able business model for this kind of project that at the moment they are not so competitive as other oh. projects and they require to mobilize this huge amount of uh, money. Mm. Sure. So I really like this Green Deal or the new Commission's uh, policy program because they focus on the ETS. Yeah. For sure, we need a right pricing signal for carbon dioxide. 
is completely crazy that the number one topic in the parliament, that's climate, and the number one tool, price, on, on CO2, it's, it's not following each other. So that's how strong they have been impacted by industries or member states. We have to see what the new parliament will do. At least, I guess, the commission will introduce an increased focus on ETS. She also wrote carbon border price because they also want to secure the, the competitiveness of, of the European industries. So we, we shouldn't enforce the European industries with a lot of additional cost, and then we as consumers would buy Chinese products, which is not fulfilling the Paris goals. So I think it could be very good for the European Union to introduce some kind of facility that assessed the, the life cycle cost of some products and then made a tax on those so that in Europe we would buy green products. And if China made green products, we would also buy those. And, and if we could compete and we hope that we are better in making green products than they are in China, then we would support our own industries. I'm not politicians. This is what they talk about. I, I only reflect. Yes, my name is Inigo Del Guayo from the University of Almeria. And I, I would like to, to go back to the slide about the gas forum terminology. Yes. And uh, my concern is that, as far as I know, I, I might be wrong, European legislation, the new renewables directive, yes. and the, the uh, sustainable fuels directive, yeah. yes. they are not so detailed no. like this one. No. So if this is the case, we may have uh, many problems, as the one you mentioned about Germany opposing to get uh, a renewable gas with oxygen from Denmark, yes. because something which is renewable for Denmark is not for Germany, no. and so on. No. So do you think, my question is, do you think that due to the lack of detail in European legislation, mm. it will be for the gas forum to come into a guideline or something like that? Mm. It's also a very good question. Hmm. Here, in, here in Madrid, I represent ENSOC and Gas Infrastructure Europe, together with one of Enagas's colleagues, Francisco de la Flor. We call him Paco, I guess. <laughs> I call him Francisco. Yeah, every call, everyone calls him Paco. Uh, we start most of our interventions by, by this topic, I have, I've, 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 I've not mentioned it today, that last year the Commission closed the clean energy package, but it was only about electricity. So in fa and, and they made the renewables energy directive, and these aspects they didn't include. So in my views, the Commission made a mistake. They have made a huge legislative package which is missing some solutions for the gas sector. We don't say to the Commission anymore because they have recognized it. In any case, the Commission, they have started to the left in this figure, and, 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 and it took them one and a half years to make that political compromise. So I can feel that it's very difficult for them <coughs> to, to fold this out. But I hope that they will, in the gas package or in the coming decarbonization package, that they will, let's say, put something next to the existing legislation. Because, as I said, this is foolish. This is, this is cheap black and very expensive green, but there are different shades of green in between which the countries should be allowed uh, to, uh, uh, to take. Um, it's also the same. If you go into the electricity directive, it's very detailed on energy storage about power to gas conversion as seen from the electricity side. And there they have already now said how a lot of the regulations should be very detailed. So we, so we are going to have sector coupling, but they have only made this regulation and they have not assessed what is going on here. So in some topics, the, the, the new electricity directive is like this and the gas sector is here. We don't connect. And the commission will not change the electricity directive. So the only thing is that we in the gas sector take the challenge and we change the gas sector to meet the electricity sector. One example, in the electricity sector, they have hourly balancing. And the, with the renewable, in, in, in my country, we have 15 minutes intervals. We will go to five minutes as, as they have in Norway. In the end, minutes, seconds, I, I, I don't know. 
the, the smaller the segments, the cheaper it is to balance for, for the entire market. But in the electricity directive, you have an hourly balance. In the gas sector, we have a daily balance. And that means that, for instance, sector coupling of moving the renewable problem into gas storage so you can store, that's today impossible. And the electricity sector is locked. So one of the assessments we do in, in, in the Brussels organization is, should we change the gas balancing model? Or could we make some kind of retrofit that our daily model and their hourly model fit together in some kind of way? Because if it doesn't fit together, then we don't see any going to invest or to use this. They simply just say, no, it's, 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 it's not possible. So we will use batteries instead. Instead of using the enormous, very cheap gas storages which is available. So part of also my own transition is that instead of, let's say, hoping that the commission will make the right decisions and make a perfect regulation, I think that we should really scrutinize ourselves and see can we change ourselves. So the politicians are here in many aspects, and we need to adapt that. So I, I, I guess if you go back to the gas history in Spain, in, uh, in Spain it started with the consumers. How... Where were the power plants? Where were the industrial sites? And then the gas, we came with the solutions to our consumers. And to some extent, we should think as the politicians and the commission as like some kind of new consumer. We need to adapt to them. Because if we don't give them so the solution so we fit into their equation, we are not in the equation. We are, we are outside of the equation, which is not nice. Yes? Yeah. Well, my name is Christina Juste. I'm coming from Naturgy. And I would like to know if in Denmark you have any project of synthetic gas that's been injected in the gas network. We, we have uh, one project, which is um, methanization of hydrogen. We have two there in Copenhagen. They're very small. Um, and they are, f at least yesterday, they were producing gas for the, for the city gas networks uh, in Copenhagen. So, so in my country, for this technology, we are on, on level number two in the first graph I showed. It's very immature in my con country. So uh, it's, let's say, almost research and development. Uh, if I go to the Netherlands, they have big facilities which is doing it on an industrial side. Um, so I think that uh, so in our company we will send some people to Netherlands and Germany and start talking to the industries uh, to get information and knowledge from, uh, from them. So we have the two projects. They, they are on the homepage. You can see them. We could give you some information. But, but going from there and then to large scale... It's, it's not what we're doing now. Hello. Hello? Hello. Yes. I am Eduardo Ivo. I work for the Ministry of Trade. And my agency is focused on uh, developing uh, uh, opportunities for, for companies, okay? So my, my question is uh, how do public sector and uh, private sector will divide or will share the, the activity in the future? I don't know if it's a project or it's just a guess to what you will be yes. telling. It's a very good uh, question also. When, when we started producing biomethane, we made a project uh, that someone else invested into a biomethane production <laughs> site and we had the biomethane in our networks and I was very glad. I thought now I reach the goal, I'm done. And then a lot of these consumers or industries which you represent also, or the, at least their, uh, their sector, they came to us and said, within the transport sector, there is a national law on blending of green fuels. In Denmark, biomethane was not a green fuel. So we could not take biomethane into the existing law on transport. For industrial purposes, they're here. 
and power plants. No, let's start with industries. The, the national climate accounts did not include the option for biomethane into industries. Not even Eurostat, the European Commission had that feature. If I took biomethane green gas into a power plant, I didn't get a guarantee of origin. It produced black electricity. So, so, even, so I thought I had solved the problem. I had biomethane in my pipes. And then I discovered that all the legislation receiving the biomethane was not ready in Denmark. So it took us two years, not us, but it took ministries two years to pave the way to change existing legislation so that the value chain from the biomethane into the consumption segment was active. They got a benefit. They, they, they could actually receive blending benefits or industrial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so for sure, we need to have the focus uh, on the industries. That's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that who's best in doing what? And personally, I'm very open-minded. I have been 25 years in the gas and electricity sector like this. 10 years here, 15 years here. Um, I don't know who should invest in these solutions. But I can tell you that if we are delayed, my politicians will have a problem because we will not reach Paris 2050. So I think the regulators should be open-minded, as is the case in the new electricity directive. There, for instance, for ownership of power to gas, these units here, there it's stipulated that the system operator or the regulator makes a tender for, ele ele for electrolyzers. So you could have a tender on 100 megawatt electrolyzers, even perhaps with a, with, a, with a cap on the price. And if there are commercial bidders, they will construct under the terms and conditions. And then the electricity director continues, if there's no bids, the TSOs could invest. And I think that it's a good model. So instead of having uh, this discussion about whether is it commercial, contestable businesses, or is it regulated businesses, in fact, we don't know. One of the questions I've asked to this PhD program, that is, find out. I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether this is a natural monopoly or not. If I make a parallel to the biomethane uh, plant, <clears throat> we had in the beginning a legislation where, uh, where cost followed the individual. So the first biomethane plant into a distribution network, it was free, almost free, because all the biomethane could be taken by the consumption. Then the next and the third. Then came the fourth biomethane plant to the same area. Then suddenly they needed to expand the distribution network to handle the production of local biomethane. Then this fourth production of biomethane, they paid for this expansion, 20 kilometer pipeline. Then the next, number fifth and sixth, paid it not. And number seven, there was so much biomethane that we made a compressor taking the biomethane from distribution to me. So number seven paid me. So now we had made a new model, which is I pay for the connections. And then I decide where they go in. So instead of having a lot of biomethane plants coming in the wrong places in, in the network, I would rather invest a bit more for a longer pipeline or a larger compressor so it's cheaper for me. What also happened is that the number four biomethane producer, which were having, let's say, he was needing a compression, no, that was number seven, a compression to, to, to me. He said, I will only pay for the compression needed for my excess biomethane. And I said to them, no, 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 no. I need to big, build a very big compressor because plant number eight and nine will also need to have compression. So there was also the problem that the commercial players, they didn't invest in the right size. 
they made the wrong geographical decisions. They didn't invest in the right size, and 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 that's why I was given the task. So I, so I I cannot answer truly, but for me personally, it should be a mix. Let the commercial players use their money if they want to, and if they don't, ask the regulators players to invest and make a good regulation that we invest on socioeconomic analysis in the right sizes at the right geographies, otherwise it will be too expensive. Thank you, Torben. Ah, oh, sorry. So no this question. is the last question. <laughs> I can send you some links, because for instance, this graph here, we prepared one and a half year ago and a half year ago two reports there in English, which is about sector coupling and power to X, which is in fact in the Danish case assesses all I've said uh, in much more detail. Uh, Fernando Suarez from Sidema Engineering and Consulting Company, a member of the Spanish Association of Biogas. Uh, listening to you, uh, it looks to me like we are in a different galaxy, you know? Yes. Uh, we are now uh, starting with biomethane, but to have biomethane, biogas is necessary, okay? So uh, you link everything to energy, but there is another uh, connection with pollution, eh, with uh, waste treatment, for instance, mm. because you know that in Spain most of the biogas is produced from landfill, mm. and landfill is going to to end because <laughs> the the landfill directive uh, determines that uh, that the organic waste cannot be go into into landfill in the in the next years. So uh, the other sources mm, here there are few 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 sources because. Uh, <coughs> For instance, when I have a son living in Copenhagen, and when I am landing in Copenhagen, I can see a lot of small biogas plant in farms and so on. No? Here, it doesn't exist because oh. there is no, uh, it's not only because uh, you need subsidies, you need also a pressure of the, of the government mm. uh, in order to avoid the pollution that many of the waste are producing, not sure. only farm waste, also sure. I am working on farm waste, but also in, in municipal waste. Eh? Mm. So uh, in, in, this, uh, in the case of Denmark, what is the weight you think have in the, in the promotion and in the development of the, of the biomethane or the biogas initially, uh, the waste of the, the weight of the subsidies or grants or helping of the government and the, the weight of the pressure <laughs> again uh, to, 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 to fight against, produ uh, against uh, pollution, no? mm -hmm. to, 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 to treat uh, yes. waste, you know, because there are two, two yes, different sir. things. It's also a very good question. Um, again, in Denmark, we have a very stable subsidy scheme. It has just been prolonged until 2031. Uh, we had so much money annually, now it's less money for new plants, and they will be on a tender scheme. So how much capacity can be invested for the lowest amount of money? Uh, so to some extent, it has been easy. But answering your question, we have examples of both. So some of the most um, well-known biomethane production sites in Denmark is coming from the municipalities. So it was a very known local farmer, and he had a waste and he wanted to make the city green. And he uh, went to the mayor's office saying that I want to have some licenses to have a biomethane plant. And then the mayor sent him to the local bus company. And the local bus company said, OK, fine. If we can get local biomethane, we will big, put big posters on the buses saying you're driving on local shit or local biomethane or whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> So some of the cities in Denmark, it's locally founded. I think they would have done it in any case without the subsidy. In the other end, the biggest plants, our biggest plants are 20, 30, and 40 million cubes per year. It's very big plants. They are today owned by a UK capital fund. So it started as a Danish initiative, and now it's, let's say, taken up by, let's say, global money. 
and they are buying this company not because of the subsidies in Denmark, but because that they want to copy the business model in France, the Netherlands, Germany, and other countries. And in any case, they also believe that that the bigger plants and the more plants you have, the higher probability for reducing the costs. So I ha- in my country, we have examples of both entrepreneurs wanting to clean the air or the pollution in their local society, and then the big black-suited people coming in on planes from UK. And then they meet and talk about biomethane, and then you cannot see who's who because they, they all want to, let's say, develop in this picture here. So, so for me, and, and again, you started saying that, uh, that, uh, that we are on a different planet. Six years ago, I had no biomethane. Eight years ago, I had not a Danish paper on biomethane from the government. And now we are here. So perhaps we are not on the different planets, but we are looking in different directions, and your politicians, to some extent, will need... To, to focus on the green 2050 yeah, future at some time, and then I will find that we are probably much closer to each other. I talk a lot with, the, with, the, with some of Inagas colleagues, and, and you are state-owned, you have a state-owned infrastructure. We have many of the legal uh, paragraphs on the, on the gas and power sector in Spain is similar to what we have. You have a lot of sun and wind. We have a lot of renewable. You saw we were very close to each other. So even though that we have different politicians, I think that, that to some extent we have, we have a different starting point. I, I even heard how many cows and pigs you have here. So you have also a lot of manure that could be utilized in this. So let's say that there came, let's say, a tax on manure in, in Spain or in other countries that you were taxed for, for putting the manure on ground then there would also be an economic incentive. So it's not a subsidy, but you go and say the farms add an externality to the society and they have to pay. I, probably farmers in Spain are very strong, so it, it will not come soon, but it might, be a, it might be a tool. But I will send you some slides. You can, not only the slides, some links, and you can go to them and see. And then I hope to, to, to meet Mo, yeah, many of you. Uh, in green gas or, or <laughs> gas projects in the future. Thank you, Torben. Oh, okay. you're welcome. Just to finish, just to finish on time. Let me finish. Uh, Torben was saying that we are moving towards an energy system that is complex, is hybrid. But I think uh, I'm convinced that Torben has been able to provide some light in these new decarbonation routes for the natural gas, blending, hydrogen, or biomethane. And at least we have an uh, in-depth and um, what the best knowledge of the, the future of natural gas and its role in this transition. Thank you, Torben. You're welcome. Y no quisiera finalizar sin, sin agradecer, lo dicho en la introducción, toda la colaboración y la verdad es que el desempeño del equipo fantástico de Nagas, el presidente de la cabeza, pero bueno, todo el equipo feliz, Alexandra, Cristina, Silvia... Agradecerles a ellos pues, esta excelente organización y la verdad que esta excelente jornada. Eh, invitaros, no me queda más que invitaros a aquí en Madrid. En octubre presentamos un trabajo que se ha realizado sobre digitalización del sector energético, con lo que son las implicaciones, Torben lo explicaba antes, el papel que tiene la transición. Y en noviembre tendremos eh, una, un seminario sobre el mercado organizado del gas con el presidente de Midgas, con Raúl Junta en el que continuaremos trabajando y abarcando lo que es pues, el, papel del, el papel del gas. Muchísimas gracias a todos.